I live in Tucson, Arizona, where summer temperatures often reach above 105 degrees. I replaced three or four new motors from my RV Coleman Mach AC unit in as many years. It seemed about each year I would have to replace these motors, and I knew that something was wrong. Getting only one summer season or a year and a half summer season from each motor and then having to buy a brand new motor was ridiculous and costly. After doing research and watching YouTube videos, replacing the capacitors and squirting some lubricant on the shaft in hope of getting some oil onto the bearings, the motors either continued squealing or seized up. After the first one died and could not be repaired, the new ones I then installed when they started to make strange or squealing noises, I would immediately turn off my AC and try to figure out what the problem was and how I might fix them. Unlike other small motors, like for example what you find in evaporative or swamp cooler motors, these do not have oil ports to re-oil the bearings. This did not make sense to me because in a hot desert climate with punishing extreme heat like Tucson, I knew what the sun beating on outdoor equipment can do, especially to motors that ran virtually all day and night in the hot season. Here is a picture of one of the new motors that soon started giving me problems after I installed it. Notice the bearing material oozing out of the motor around the shaft. In the other picture, you can see how this bearing material splattered all over the unit. I will explain this bearing material later. I decided to remove the motors from the unit and take the motor apart to re-oil the bearings. It was not as difficult as I thought, and here's how I did it. First, I had to remove the motor from out of the AC unit. Observe common sense safety measures and make certain all the power is completely off to your AC unit. Turn the breaker off and also turn the unit off at your thermostat that controls the AC inside. If you wish to be absolutely safe from being electrocuted, unplug your RV from the electric box you are hooked up to so zero power is being delivered to the RV. Here is the video I used to learn how to remove the motor. This video is one of the best I found on YouTube for removing the motor. Though it did not show one of the most important steps, this one of taking the mounting plate off and reinstalling it, it is still helpful. Once you are able to remove the motor, the next step is to take off the motor mount. This is where the video I linked to above falls short because it did not show the all-important step of carefully removing the rubber-like pad that is glued to the metal mounting plate. In this picture, I show how you can remove this entire back portion by taking one of the corners and slowly and carefully pulling it back a little at a time. It's possible this process might be easier if you take a hair dryer and warm up this portion and or take a sharp putty knife to help start this edge so you can get enough of the rubber material pulled back to grab it with your fingers. You need to have patience to slowly pull this mat off in one piece. I took my time and was able to get it all off in one piece as shown in the pictures. You can see in this picture how dirty the plate is. It will help to clean this off. Carefully put this piece aside in a safe place where it will not be damaged or dropped on the ground. You will need to reattach it during reassembly. This is the 11 32nd inch nut driver attachment I use to remove the four nuts that hold the mounting plate onto the motor. You can use a socket or regular adjustable wrench or whatever tool you have on hand that will take these off. You don't need fancy or specialized tools to do this job. Both the motor and the plate were dirty. I used this to clean off the outside of the motor because it was oily and greasy. I took this small file and used it to score marks onto both parts of the now clean metal housing of the motor. Why you do this is so when you put the sections back together, these marks line them up so you can properly reassemble them. If you don't have a file, use whatever is handy to make marks in the metal housing 
an owl, nail, screwdriver, end of a screw, a magic marker, whatever. The next step is to remove the nuts from the bolts that hold the pieces of the motor housing together. I use this 5 16 inch small wrench to remove each of the four nuts from the long bolts that hold the motor housing together. I then gently pulled these four long thin bolts out of the metal housing and put them safely aside. At this point, the two blue end pieces need to be separated from the motor housing. I used a screwdriver and rubber mallet to gently tap the ends off. With the one end off, you can now see the guts of the motor. The bearing we want to re-oil is inside the end caps. Slide this end cap completely off the metal shaft so you can inspect the bearing and apply more oil to it. Here are some shots of what this bearing looks like. They are called sleeve or plain bearings, very different from the more common ball bearings we might think about when the topic of motor bearings come up. In doing research on these sleeve bearings, there is all kinds of information you have to sift through to separate truth from fiction. This sleeve bearing, as you can see, has some type of a spongy-like material in it. This motor was made by Fasco, and from their website, they say this material is called Permawick, defined as, quote, a blend of cellulose, fiber, and turbine oil. It has the appearance of oil-soaked sawdust and has the advantage of holding 30% more lubricant than the wool felt system. This is the material used in all FASCO motor bearing systems. For routine maintenance and improved bearing life expectancy, a few drops of non-detergent 20 weight oil can be added every 12 months." End quote. Interestingly, the company that makes this Permawick says this from their website, quote, Permawick is a wicking lubricant that can be machine injected into any size or shape of bearing reservoir. Permawick material permanently lubricates sleeve bearing system. There is no need to reoil Permawick. Permawick is a blend of engineered fibers and formulated oil that bonds to form a unique oil delivery system. End quote. A thorough discussion of whether or not you should re-oil these sleeve bearings is an interesting and important one, but outside the scope of this video. My opinion, having gone through a handful of these motors year after year and having them fail on me, my opinion is, yes, they do need re-oiling, regardless of what the manufacturers claim and why I'm making this video. Some of the permawick detached from inside the sleeve bearing and accumulated around the shaft. I gathered it together and pressed it back into the bearing. Unlike one of the other motors that went bad, this material still had oil in it and was not all dried out like one of the other motors. The amount and type of oil to be reintroduced back into the bearings is important. Putting too much oil is just as bad as not having enough oil. In doing your own research on sleeve bearings, you might come across people who say you can use grease. This would be a mistake, in my opinion, as grease eventually dries up, hardens, and will gum up the permawick material, not allowing it to lubricate the spinning shaft. Use light oil like the Zoom Spout or 3-in-1, the one in the blue can. Because both bearings on this motor still had oil in them, I only put about five or six drops into each bearing, going around in a circle to ensure the bearing was evenly saturated. Putting on so much oil that it runs out of the bearing is a mistake and can ruin the motor if this excess oil is thrown into the windings of the motor and other interior parts while it is running. Your bearings might be completely dry which will require more oil than what I used for this particular motor. Go slow and make sure you are not putting in too much oil. Allow time for the oil to soak evenly into the permawick before deciding you need to add more oil. Do not use solvents like WD-40 to re-oil these bearings. Very important. 
After removing the other side of the motor housing and re-oiling that bearing, allow the two halves of the housing to sit upright to make sure no oil drips out. If it does, you know you have put too much oil in them and you can then take your fingers, gently press on the permawick material and see if you can force some of the oil out. If no oil drips out after 10 minutes or so, put the motor back together using the file marks you previously made to correctly align it, reinstall the bolts and nuts, and then reinstall it back onto the plate. The rubber mat should stick back on. Mine did with no problem. If it doesn't, you could use a bit of rubber cement like I did or something similar on the sticky side of it and this might help in reattaching it. Again, whatever works and is handy. If you have never removed your motor to re-oil these bearings, give yourself at least four to six hours of time from the beginning to the end of the project. Your skill level will determine whether you need more or less time than this, but this will probably give you a ballpark figure what it took me, and I'm certainly no RV tech expert. Best of success on your project.